Hi students, welcome back to Geology. Today we are talking about Earth's geosphere. More specifically, we're going to start with looking at continental drift and the rise of plate tectonics. All right, so first things first, what is the geosphere? The geosphere refers to the solid part of Earth. So this is what you are standing on, all the rocks, the minerals, the landforms, and the processes that shape those things. Um, so we're talking about the surface of the Earth here. So throughout this lecture and the next one, we're going to talk about continental drift, the layers of the Earth, and Earth's tectonic plates. And we're going to take it slow and go through each of the theories first before we really dive into what plate tectonics is, which is the big unifying theory here. So the first thing that we need to think about is why does Earth have mountains and valleys? So you've probably noticed that we, if you live in the Central Valley like I do, we live in this big, vast valley. And there are mountains on either side of us. How did those get there? Why do we see those mountains next to our large valley? Why isn't it just one big valley? So if you think about some of these things, we're going to start answering those questions as we go through these lectures so that you better understand how our Earth is shaped. All right, so for a very long time, um, most people assumed that the continents and the oceans were fixed and nothing was moving because there was no reason to believe that there was anything moving. Um, science was just getting off the ground um, in terms of studying the earth and its properties and how things shape the earth. And so it wasn't until um, the late 1800s that a fella named Alfred Wegener started doing um, some expeditions to places like Greenland, Iceland, and started making a lot of observations about the world that he saw and how things were different, how he saw a lot of the same fossils in different areas. And so he started to develop this theory, um, which we now know as the theory of continental drift. Unfortunately, before um, he was able to push forward a lot of his evidence and his theory. Um, he did die on his last expedition, which obviously was his last, um, but it was his fourth expedition to um, Greenland. But he was able to put in writing four pieces of evidence that supported his theory. And those four pieces of evidence are here. So the first one is a puzzle piece fit. So if you look at the map, of the world, you can kind of see how some of them would fit together. So if you look at the bottom left there, it will show you how some of the continents will fit together, kind of like a puzzle piece. So there's a couple of activities if you're interested, where you can kind of play around with this. You can cut out the different continents and start to piece them together to kind of see how they would fit. Okay, so that was his first piece of evidence. So they looked puzzle piece-ish to him. The second piece he had was fossil evidence. He noticed that there were similar fossils found on different land masses that were not connected at the time. So for example, there is um, the Mosasaur, which was found on several different continents. And the Mosasaur could not swim across the Atlantic Ocean, but it was found in South America and Africa. And so unless those were together at one point, there was no indication as to why the Mosasaur would have been everywhere basically on the globe if some of these continents weren't closer together. Same thing with some land animals and some plants. Um, this kind of suggested that things might have been moving. Okay, and then we also have the rock evidence. So with rocks, they will give a specific chemical signature and age. So if a rock is found to have a certain chemical signature and age, it's similar to some other rock somewhere else on Earth, you might assume that they formed in the same mountain building event. So if they formed in the same mountain building event, then those land masses must have been connected at some point in time as well. And the fourth piece of evidence that he had was climate change or glacial evidence. So glaciers have been found um, mostly in Antarctica, North Pole, the northern regions, very high altitudes, right? 
but there is evidence that there were glaciers in Africa and South America and India, Australia, some point in Earth's history. So what that means is, is that those continents had to have been in an area where glaciers can exist. So they needed to be closer to, let's say, the South Pole, for example. So if that were to happen, that means they would have moved at some point in time. So this was his theory, right? That he had these different pieces of evidence to suggest that the continents were not fixed and that they had moved at some point. So he called it continental drift. And the big issue that he had was that he didn't have the mechanism. He did not have the why or the how these things were moving. Um, and so a lot of new scientists started entering the picture once Alfred Wigner died and they started working on that theory. Um, before we start talking about those theories though, we need to learn about the layers of the earth. Okay, so there are three basic layers of the earth, but we'll kind of dive into them even more deep as we go through this. So the first one is the crust, which is what you stand on. So that is the surface of the earth. The next one down is the mantle, and then the center is the core. Okay, so those are the three basic layers that you might have learned a long time ago, but we're going to get deeper with it. Okay, so the crust, like I said, is only about five to seven kilometers in thickness, and it ranges depending on whether we're talking about stuff that's on the continent or we're talking about the ocean. The mantle is going to be divided in a couple of different layers that we'll talk about, but it's approximately 29 kilometers um, at depth. Okay, so it's a pretty thick layer. And then the core is our innermost layer, and um, we have the inner and the outer core, which we will talk about in a second. All right, so looking at the Earth's crust, we have two different types of crust. We have continental crust and we have oceanic crust. Okay, the reason that it's important to distinguish between the two is because they have different features. So continental crust is the thicker layer, which water does not sit on. So we see about 35 kilometers on average here. But the oceanic crust is thinner, which is where the ocean basins are. And it's about seven kilometers thick on average. All right, looking at their composition, with the continental crust, like I said, it is thick. It is less dense than oceanic crust. It's buoyant and it's mostly old granite. So granite is a type of igneous rock, which you can see a picture of there. <clears throat> it's kind of got a black and white uh, mineral composition. So we see light minerals and we see dark minerals. This is the rock that is very popular in Yosemite. Um, so this rock has a lower density than the rock that the, makes up the oceanic crust. So the oceanic crust is basalt. Basalt has a much higher density than granite does. And so we see a much more dense material in the oceanic crust than we do the continental crust. The oceanic crust is also, like I said, very thin and it's also very young. We'll kind of talk about why that is in um, a couple slides. All right, so looking at the Earth's mantle, we get down into the upper mantle first, just after the crust. Um, this is relatively rigid. It also contains the asthenosphere, which is a semi-fluid layer that allows movement of the tectonic plates. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then the lower mantle um, um, is solid and contributes to the overall convection and heat transfer within the Earth's interior. Okay, so we need to kind of delineate these pieces so we understand how the rigid, hard crust will actually move. Okay, so how does the crust move? So let's think about heat transfer for a second. So there's three basic types of heat transfer, right? We have radiation, conduction, and convection. Radiation is like the sun radiating heat onto your face or a fire pit radiating heat onto your face or your skin. Conduction is when you touch something and there's a transfer of heat between what is hot and what you are touching. And then convection is the cycling of density within a fluid with a heat source providing that density transfer. So for example, in a boiling pot of water, you have a heat source, which is the stove, and then the water bubbles as it's rotating within the pot. So when it gets, when the water gets close to the heat source, it heats up and becomes less dense. 
things that are less dense tend to rise. So it rises to the surface of the pot, at the top of the pot, it cools down a bit. And so it cycles back down, becomes more dense and falls. And you have this cycling of heat within your pot, which is what allows it to boil. So you can also think of a lava lamp. So in a lava lamp, you have a heating element at the bottom that heats up the material and the oil in the material is oil and resin in the material or in the chamber. And the oil and resin will heat up closer to the bottom of that, where that heating element is. And it becomes less dense, so it will rise. And then at the top, there's no heating element. It starts to cool down a bit, becomes more dense and falls. And so that's how a lava lamp works. It works using convective heat transfer. And so when we look at the mantle, we have learned from Arthur Holmes that there are convection currents. So we call this mantle convection. This is a theory coined by Arthur Holmes in 1928. And it describes the movement of the mantle as it transfers heat from the hot core to the cold crust. Okay, so if you look at these convective cells here, you can see that as they're closer to the outer core, they're warmer. And then as they go up to the crust, they cool down. So the blue arrows are cool and the red arrows are warm. And so if we have a cycle of these convective cells and they move towards each other or they move away from each other, they can start to move the crust at the top. And so that's how the actual crust can move. All right, so looking at the Earth's core, we go down into the outer core and then the inner core. The outer core is a liquid layer composed mainly of molten iron and nickel, and it has a thickness of about 2,300 kilometers. And then the inner core is solid. Why is it solid? So the inner core is solid because there's so much pressure down there that nothing can flow, nothing can move. The molecules are so tightly compressed and there's so much pressure they can't move, so it just becomes a solid. So the inner core is our solid layer portion of the core, and their interaction creates what we call a magnetic field. And in a couple of slides, we'll talk about why that's important. Um, the radius of the inner core is about 1,200 kilometers, and it is iron and nickel as well. So after mantle convection from Arthur Holmes started to develop, other scientists started to do more expeditions, like doing sonar mapping. Um, so in the 1940s, um, sonar mapping was starting to be used for um, world wars, but also for um, science. So here we see a boat over the water. And so the way this works is a boat goes along the ocean and it sends a signal, an acoustic signal, down to the ocean floor. That signal is reverberated or bounced off of the material that's down there. So the rocks that are down at the seafloor. And it comes back up. And they can measure how long it took that sound to return to get a distance to the bottom of the ocean floor. And from there, they can make a map of the ocean floor so they know what it looks like. And so one of the first geologists to do this was Marie Tharp, and she created the first detailed map of the ocean floor in the Atlantic. And the weird thing about this is because it was the 1940s, she was not actually allowed on the boat. So she had to rely on this fellow Bruce, who is pictured here with Marie in the center, um, to help relay the information to her because she couldn't actually go on the expedition. Um, that's obviously since then changed, but it's just an interesting note of history that one of the first female geologists to kind of put her name on the map didn't even get to go do the field work, um, which I'm sure was difficult, especially after she wasn't taken very seriously about there being something particular in the middle of the Atlantic um, until Harry Hess, who's pictured on the bottom left, started to propose the idea of seafloor spreading in 1959. So looking at a map of the ocean floor, they saw in the middle of the Atlantic that there was a ridge, which we call the Mid-Ocean Ridge or the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. 
And at these ridges, there seemed to be a lot of heat and activity volcanically. And so it kind of made people think, what's going on in the middle of the ocean? We thought this was just an ocean basin that had no ridges, had no mountains. It should just be a flat bottom ocean floor. Well, that wasn't the case when they did the sonar mapping and they found these ridges. And so they also found that these ridges were relatively young based on the thickness of the sediment that they found. So this is when Harry Hess started to develop his seafloor spreading theory. And that is our theory to kind of go with our mantle convection from Arthur Holmes. So in 1960, Harry Hess coined seafloor spreading, the theory of seafloor spreading, which is where continent and ocean meet at the trenches. Ocean crust is being returned to the mantle at the same rate it's being generated at the ridges. And so what this says is that there are two convection currents that are pulling away from each other in the ocean. And as they pull away, they pull crust apart. And so crust is being pulled apart at the surface. And at that meeting point is where the ridge is generating a bunch of volcanic activity. Magma is filling in that void where the two crusts are dividing. And then where that oceanic crust or oceanic plate is actually hitting the continent is where it's diving back down into the mantle and recycling material. Okay, so this is the theory of seafloor spreading. This helped explain how things could actually be moving when you use it in conjunction with mantle convection. Okay, but there was one more thing they needed. They needed a little bit more proof of some of these ages. And so with that, they started looking at paleomagnetism, which was actually invented way prior to some of these theories. Um, and this uses iron rich minerals and rocks to look at their magnetism to magnetic north. So when a rock is deposited or comes out of a lava, if it has a lot of iron in it, it's going to align itself to magnetic north. And so if you remember, I was talking about the interaction between the outer and the inner core because it's solid iron and nickel reacting with liquid iron and nickel, their interaction creates basically a big magnet around Earth, which we call the magnetic field. And so the magnetic field protects us from things like solar winds and other flares that might come from the sun and other random um, things that might fly, try to fly into our atmosphere. It protects us from a lot of those things. Um, but it also flips over time, and it takes about 300,000 years or so for a flip to occur again. Um, but when these rocks are um, crystallized out of a magma, we see them align themselves to magnetic north if they have a lot of iron in them. And so you can kind of look at their orientation and you can tell where this rock was created on Earth at the time of its deposition, where this continent might have been, you can also look at the age of the rocks because we know a little bit about the reversals at this point. So how did we use paleomagnetism to tell us something about um, the age of the rocks on the seafloor? So if you look at this image on the left here, we're looking at magnetism over time. So we have a normal magnetism, then we have a reverse, and then another normal. And so what happens here is in a diver divergent plate boundary, so where the two plates are pulling apart, material is filling in. And a lot of that is going to be basalt um, material. And basalt will have a lot of iron-rich minerals in it. Those iron-rich minerals are aligning themselves to magnetic north. And so in a normal reversal, we'll see a normal orientation. And then as time moves on and those plates are pulling apart more, more materials filling in even as a reversal occurs. So then the next set of rocks might show a reversed polarity and point to basically south, the south pole, which would have been the magnetic north pole at the time of the reversal. And then let's say another reversal happens and we go back to a normal magnetic polarity. And so you see those rocks come up and those point to true north and magnetic north at the time. And so we can look at that and look at the ages of the ocean floor and see you know, what is happening. And so this bottom right image shows you kind of the process by which a geologist would sample the rock for magnetic polarity. And so you would orient yourself, orient your sample from where you took it. You would take it to a lab and then it would tell you which direction the iron rich minerals 
um, you put it in this big machine and it demagnetizes the rock and it shows you what the polarity was at the time. And then you can reorient yourself with your field notes and see which direction was magnetic north in that field area. And so that can tell us something about what the rocks are doing, what the plates are doing. And so we used paleomagnetism to study the ocean floor. So when we look at the ocean floor, um, this is the Pacific Ocean particularly, we're off the coast of Northern California um, and then Oregon, Washington, the Pacific uh, West Coast. So Pacific Northwest, excuse me. So here you can see the red is the younger material. And as you move away from the red, it gets older and it's parallel, right? There's a pattern to the colors and the ages, right? So as you move away from that ridge, things are getting older, but you see it on both sides. So that gives you further evidence that things are splitting and being pulled apart. And so this is important because it shows us that the oldest rocks are going to end up against the continent. And right in the center here is where all the new young rocks are being created, where the plates are pulling apart. And so with all of this, the theory of tectonics started to develop. It was not coined by any one scientific individual, but um, it was kind of a combination of all of these guys that I've been talking about so far. Um, and this happened between 1965 and 1967. While that doesn't sound like a long time ago to you, or it sounds like a long time ago, that's really recent as far as theories in science goes. So play tectonics wasn't really widely taught in schools until about the 90s um, and in like grade school or high school because it wasn't a well accepted theory until the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, it was still kind of in its infancy in the 70s and 80s. And not a lot of people wanted to believe that, that it was really true, um, especially since we can't prove it 99.9% .9 of the time like gravity. Um, but this theory shows us that there are tectonic plates on Earth. These are some of the major tectonic plates on this um, map here. And it tells us that we're looking at a bunch of different plates interacting and creating our volcanoes and our earthquakes and bumping into each other and creating all kinds of new rocks um, and recycling rocks at the same time. So with that, we have our seven major tectonic plates and these are them. We have North America, South America, Eurasia, Africa, India, and the Pacific plate in Antarctica. Um, Antarctica, remember, it's not actually this big. So when you look on a globe, because Antarctica is around the South Pole, it actually shrinks. Um, but when we depict it on a world map, it ends up looking a lot bigger. And then Pacific Ocean, because it's right near the equator, it actually stretches, which is why the Pacific plate is actually our largest plate. And in the next video, you'll watch how um, the Pacific plate is kind of a real big backbone of looking at volcanoes and earthquakes and where these things are going to occur. So the next thing you're going to do is you're going to watch the plate tectonic boundaries lecture. You're going to complete your lab and your discussion post, and you'll be done for this week. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.